This program contains coarse language. Chinese soldiers sing they will defend the motherland to the death. The message is clear. The People's Liberation Army is ready for combat. And the target is Taiwan. China is a force not to be bullied. If anyone threatens China with force, they will be dealt with by force in return. Tensions over Taiwan are the highest in nearly three decades and could result in a wider war in the Pacific. Beijing is preparing for the conflict. The Chinese have deployed huge numbers on a scale never before. Warships, submarines, fighter aircraft and nuclear capable bombers. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. President Xi Jinping has warned China will use force over Taiwan. I think it's somewhat inevitable that China uses limited force against Taiwan in the next three to four years. The big issue is whether we see a full-out war. And if war erupts, the Americans will need Australia. The United States is operating under the assumption that Australia would join its coalition of the willing to defend Taiwan. Australian people should not even think about sending your sons and daughters to fight for separatism of Taiwan. On Four Corners, we examine China's end game and how any invasion of Taiwan may trigger a bloody regional conflict with casualties on a scale not seen since World War II. We reveal how the United States is quietly building up its military assets here in Northern Australia, including plans to deploy nuclear-capable B-52 bombers, pulling us deeper into any future conflict. It's just after dawn in Australia's top end. A platoon of US Marines is awaiting orders to begin its final assault. There's a quiet tension amid the dust and building heat. He's gonna check us to make sure we don't move too fast, break. I want actual teaser rubber. As they prepare to move out, the Marines are joined by two Australian tanks. I suggest them moving the tanks down into the blocking position now. Roger, sound good. The Marines are playing at war, and the enemy in this exercise is a group of Australian soldiers hidden deep in the bush. There's a very old quote that says, iron sharpens iron uh, as one man sharpens the other. So we are fighting against ourselves and we find that that sets conditions for us to be successful, we believe, on the next battlefield. All right, sir. Colonel Christopher Steele is the commanding officer for the US Marines who've come to Darwin this year as part of an annual deployment. It could be that there's more significance to this terrain here than... He's watching from behind the front line. We've definitely faced massive resistance, resistance that we were not expecting, to be quite honest with you, as we push south through here. The bottleneck, I think they know their own turf very well. We're gonna get online so we can, we can push them out a little bit. 
It's a continuation of a series of exercises in which we've partnered with the Australian military over the last six months. Sergeant Anthony Richardson is leading today's attack. We've been out here for about eight to nine days, I believe. I think my guys are pretty strong to be able to handle whatever comes our way. Bush left! Bell, Bell, Bush left! Three, motherfucker, three! Press AT! This is a rehearsal for war. As China's military build-up has intensified over the last decade, the Americans have come to rely more heavily on Australia. You see that tan line? Well, right there. And the number of US Marines coming to Darwin each year has grown tenfold to more than 2,000. Our job is to be ready when called, regardless of threat, regardless of circumstance, regardless of environment. And that's really why we're here. Reloading. It's the US Marines and Australian tanks attacking as one. Turn your fucking calm on! Oh, fuck. To be battle ready, they need to fight as a single force. Hey, hold right there! Hey, there's not a dude, same range line! Fire and move! Fire and move! Drink water. Let's go. Hey, everybody up! It's us through! We partner at every echelon, so the ability for a United States Marine Corps engineer squad to go and provide direct support to an Australian rifle company and actually interchange that capability is, uh, is something that we look forward to and, and actually do. This ever-deepening US and Australian alliance will be called upon if China moves against Taiwan. Are you ready to fight together again? Absolutely. Are you worried that that could be sooner rather than later? I don't spend too much time worrying. I spend all my time and my Marines and sailors spend all their time preparing. Decades of rivalry between Beijing and Washington may erupt over Taiwan. The main island lies less than 180 kilometres off the southern coast of China. For Beijing, Taiwan would be a major strategic prize, giving it access beyond the so-called first island chain and into the wider Pacific. Once they gain control of Taiwan, that frees up their military to be pushing in other areas. It also allows them to project power farther out into what we call the second island chain or the waters into the Pacific and contest the United States there as well. Taiwan is part of China and there is only one China in the world. And China is in the process of achieving uh, reunification and the reunification of China is very much part and parcel of China's rejuvenation. China's President Xi Jinping has made reclaiming Taiwan a central plank of his leadership. At the recent Communist Party Congress, he reaffirmed that China wants Taiwan back. To Beijing, Taiwan is a breakaway province representing unfinished business. The status of separation between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait truly traces its origin all the way back to the Civil War in 1949 which led to the founding of the People's Republic of China in China's mainland and the fleeing from China's mainland to Taiwan by the nationalist government at that time. Therefore, the real legal status of the relations between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait is the unfinished civil war. In recent months, tensions over Taiwan took a dangerous turn when US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island. 
Immediately in the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's illicit visit to Taiwan aimed at aiding and abetting Taiwan separatism and uh, independence from China, the Chinese military conducted unprecedented large-scale military exercises and routine military drills, literally exercising complete control over the Taiwan Strait as well as the maritime region surrounding Taiwan. We've seen the most aggressive direct military pressure in terms of numbers of fighter aircraft, reconnaissance, that is intelligence collection airplanes, and warships at sea. They've never done it in that scale before. And I think that is Xi Jinping showing, hey, I've got such a much better military capability than you Taiwanese. And he's saying, this is what I can do. This has encouraged speculation Beijing could move against Taiwan sooner than previously anticipated. The time frame for an assault on Taiwan, I would put it at 2025 to 2027. And this is largely dependent on when I think the Chinese leadership, and in particular Xi Jinping, can be confident that his military can do this. So what might happen if China invaded Taiwan? In a Washington DC conference room, military analysts play out a war game to examine how the conflict might unfold. They normally do this in secret, but as tensions rise, they have gone public in the hope of deterring all sides. The war game that we conducted is really the only operational kind of war game that's available to public. When we did it to encourage discussion about the risks and opportunities involved in such a conflict and preparing for uh, such a conflict. Ships, aircraft and troops are moved around aboard. The Chinese forces are red, the US and its allies blue. In the war game, it's 2026 and China has begun its invasion. Beijing's first move is to launch a volley of ballistic missiles, destroying much of the Taiwanese Navy and Air Force. At the same time, China launches a preemptive strike on US forces in the region. They hit US ships in the Pacific and strike US bases in Japan and Guam. There's no question the initial strikes put the US on the back foot, loses a lot of ships and aircraft right uh, off the bat. As China's amphibious fleet crosses the Taiwan Strait, the US hits back. Chinese troops trying to establish a foothold in the less fortified south of Taiwan come under heavy fire. The most effective US asset was long-range bombers with cruise missiles and precision guidance. The bombers could be based outside of the uh, missile range and, uh, but still fly in and strike at the, the, the Chinese. It is likely to go on for weeks, if not months, if not longer. And as that happens, you're going to have continued fighting and loss of life, not only for the United States and its allies and partners and China, but also on the ground in Taiwan with some of the civilians who are going to suffer the most from this conflict. This would be at levels that we haven't seen since World War II, and that's pretty daunting for us to think about. The loss of ships, aircraft, and troops would be equally daunting. The US and its allies lose up to 900 aircraft and as many as 30 warships, including two aircraft carriers. It also comes at great cost to the Chinese. They lose dozens of ships and aircraft, and in the pessimistic outcomes for them, they lose a lot of prisoners of war as their beachhead is destroyed by the Taiwanese over time. 
This war game ends with the Chinese being pushed off Taiwan. Both sides are left with devastating losses. Ultimately, if China is to move on Taiwan, it will be based on a belief the PLA can prevail. I think they can do it. But more importantly, they think they can do it. And this is what's really going to shape whether or not they initiate a conflict over the Taiwan Strait. I've heard great levels of confidence in the Chinese military. And this is relatively new. For 15 years, you, I would ask the Chinese military if they could do this, and the answer was no. So the fact that for the first time at the end of 2020, they're starting to say yes, I think that's a significant message we should pay attention to. China has signaled its military is fully prepared and battle ready. To keep the public on side, the PLA pumps out a constant stream of propaganda videos. China has grown its military from a fairly rusty Soviet era force in the mid 1990s to being one of the world's most powerful militaries, perhaps the world's second most powerful military, and one optimized around preventing the United States from projecting military power into Asia. It's done this through stellar investment uh, into military modernization over 25 years. China's defence budget has more than doubled over the last decade. The PLA has built the world's largest navy, a battle force of 355 surface ships and submarines. China's air force looks impressive with 1,800 fighter jets, but they are no match for the US. This is one area where they've struggled when it came to the development of modern maneuverable aircraft and the training of pilots that could contend with US pilots in the air. Most simulations would demonstrate, for example, that in air-to-air -air combat, the United States can shoot down 13 aircraft for every one aircraft uh, that they shoot down of the United States. It is China's missiles which pose the greatest threat in any conflict over Taiwan. The latest Pentagon report estimates the PLA has around 2,500 short, intermediate and long-range ballistic missiles with the capacity to take out US bases in the Pacific. The Chinese Strategic Rocket Force possesses the most advanced cruise and ballistic program in the world. Not only advanced in terms of the technology, but also in terms of numbers, they just have more munitions than the United States can defend against. China's capability to attack or target U.S. aircraft carriers, to target U.S. bases in the region, is significant. And the United States has access to missile defense, but those are easily saturated uh, in terms of the number of missiles that China shoots can a few of them are definitely going to get through. One of China's main targets is Guam. The US territory will be vital in any conflict over Taiwan as a long-standing base for bombers, submarines and warships. China's Air Force released this video showing nuclear capable bombers unleashing a simulated attack on what looks like Guam's Anderson Air Base. Guam is simultaneously being increased as a key node in US military operations in Asia, but is also increasingly at risk from Chinese missile forces. The United States is looking to distribute its operating locations for air activity, including bomber activity, more broadly across the Indo-Pacific. 
the US no longer permanently stations its lethal fleet of bombers in Guam. Instead, the Americans want the aircraft to be operationally unpredictable. In other words, harder for the enemy to find and attack. Guam has a huge target on its back. So Guam might not be the hub of operations that it once was because at present, due to some of China's uh, missile capabilities, it is quite threatened. America has to take out an insurance policy because a lot of its forward military bases in places like the island of Guam near Japan and elsewhere in the region are coming much closer to Chinese military strike capabilities. In conventional warfare terms, North Australia is beyond that range for China at present. The North of Australia in the new geopolitical environment has suddenly become strategically much more important, if not crucial, to the United States as well as ourselves. Northern Australia is now critical to the United States strategy in the Pacific. Part of that strategy was outlined by US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin last year. I'm proud of the breadth and the depth of our alliance and it's only getting stronger. And today, we endorse major force posture initiatives that will expand our access and presence in Australia. We agreed to take immediate steps to improve interoperability through deeper integration. Three and a half hours drive south of Darwin is a facility that's increasingly significant to the US-Australia alliance. We're on our way to Tyndall Air Base, where a $1.6 billion upgrade is underway. RAF Tyndall is fast becoming one of the most important operational air bases in Northern Australia, one from which both Australia and the United States will undertake high-end military operations in the Indo-Pacific. Ever since the upgrade was announced, there's been speculation about what role Tyndall would play for the US and if it would host America's most strategically important bombers. Is the Australian government in the Well, I, I don't go into those sorts of issues at press conferences like this, uh, but what I can say is that we're equipping these facilities uh, to be able to, um, to have the maximum advantage of the relationships we have with our alliance partners. We now know preparations are well underway for the US to deploy up to six B-52 bombers to the Northern Territory. These plans to house nuclear-capable aircraft in the top end have not been announced and were only uncovered by Four Corners in US tender documents. The documents show the US Defence Department is planning to build an aircraft parking apron to accommodate six B-52s at Tyndall. In addition, there are detailed designs for the construction of a United States Air Force Squadron Operations Facility and Maintenance Centre at the base. These are to support deployed B-52 squadrons for training missions during the Northern Territory dry season. The US Air Force is also building its own fuel storage tanks and a bunker for ammunition. The US military has confirmed the construction program and told Four Corners... The ability to deploy United States Air Force bombers to Australia sends a strong message to adversaries about our ability to project lethal air power. Having B-52s located in the Indo-Pacific could be a very strong deterrent signal. B-52s happen to be nuclear capable bombers and therefore they have a larger strategic significance. So having those positioned in Australia, not necessarily saying that they would be outfitted with nuclear capability, but having the ambiguity as to whether they could or would have that on could be a very strong deterrent signal. It's a great expansion of Australian commitment to the United States war plan 
with China. It's a sign to the Chinese that we are willing to be the tip of the spear to provide a base not just for US Marines, but most importantly for their long-range power projection of heavy bombers. It's very hard to think of a more open commitment that we could make, a more open signal to the Chinese that we're going along with American planning for a war with China. To support the bombers and other military aircraft, the US is planning to spend around $1 billion in northern Australia. This includes 11 giant jet fuel storage tanks in Darwin. Having fuel would enable the United States to conduct operations from Australia, which happen to be much longer range, and having that already there, it means that therefore Australia can become a refueling hub for US aircraft, which would reduce their need to go back to the continental United States or to other bases in the region that might be closer in range for potential Chinese attacks. If war breaks out, it will be total war. Don't think by providing air bases in the northern part of Australia, it will be saving Australia. Victor Gao is one of the few Chinese insiders allowed to speak to the foreign media. You need to be fully aware what China is all about. China is a force not to be bullied. If anyone threatens China with force, they will be dealt with by force in return. So what could closer cooperation with the United States mean for Australia? In a separate war game, military analyst Becca Wasser and her team explored the risks Australia could face by joining the US in a fight over Taiwan. In a potential conflict with China over Taiwan, there is a chance that Australia could become a target, particularly if Australia were to join the fight directly or were to provide additional overflight and access rights to US forces undertaking strikes against Chinese forces. In this war game, US aircraft fly from Australian bases to attack the Chinese. That immediately puts a bullseye on Darwin and RAF Tyndall, with China launching long-range missiles towards the military targets in northern Australia. The aim is to destroy runways and fuel tanks. Ultimately, these attacks were not successful because of the long range required and because China had already expended its most capable long range and advanced missiles already earlier in the game. But who's to say that in the future, China might have more advanced missile capability that would be better suited to potentially attacking Australia or whether their attacks would be successful. We're travelling to one of the most secretive military sites in Australia. It will be instrumental for the US in any conflict with China. Around 28 kilometres outside Alice Springs lies the spy base Pine Gap. And we've been told it's expanding. Jointly run by the US and Australian intelligence agencies, operations here have always been tightly guarded. Under these golf ball-like domes sit powerful antennas, eavesdropping on foreign satellites and detecting missile launches. It is a hugely potent capability. Outside of America, it is the most potent intelligence collection facility that America has anywhere. We say no, we say no to find gap, to Pine Gap has long been the focus of protests over US bases in Australia. All of these women are here because they believe that Pine Gap is a first strike nuclear target. Pine Gap, whether it's Chinese or Russian facilities, can count in exquisite detail the silos, the ballistic missiles that both Russia and China have. 
Paul Dibb is a former head of defence intelligence and held a high-level security clearance at Pine Gap for 30 years. Do I believe that Pine Gap would be a, a target of China in the event of a serious military crisis? If it looked as though that crisis was going nuclear, China may want to take out uh, Pine Gap as being the ears and eyes of America's capability to know precisely what nuclear capabilities and where and where not the Chinese have. And the Russians in any case, including the Soviet Union in my experience, for the last 40 years have had Pine Gap as a very significant nuclear target. All Central Australian natives that grow here. It's very peaceful, it's a great haven. Kieran Fanane is a long-term resident of Alice Springs. Her latest book is about Pine Gap. We definitely know from around town um, that there is a, a big infrastructure expansion there and I have had that confirmed by authorities. It was described as a, something like a midlife upgrade for the old girl. So is this all Crown land through here? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. The fact that it's out of sight, out of mind, really does help keep it out of most people's consciousness most of the time. And so any of the questions that might arise around it don't have to be dealt with. I'd lived here for almost three decades before I took myself on one of the treks to a vantage point where you could see it in the landscape. They're quite rugged hills in reasonably remote locations that you need to climb to be able to see it in the landscape and to get a sense of its very real presence here and what it means for us. This is about as close as we can get to Pine Gap. I mean, we could push along a little further, perhaps, but I think, yeah, not much further before we'd come to the boundary. Um, and what would happen to us if we went on? Well, you're facing potentially seven years in jail. Kieran Fanane wants more people to know what goes on at this joint American-Australian base. Do you think that people understand what this place is used for? It's called a spy base. I always use the term military base, though, because what we've become aware of is that the surveillance is fed directly to military operations. It is a military base. There are changes happening all over Pine Gap all the time. This is one of the big ones, as right now. Melbourne academic and peace activist Richard Tanter has devoted his career to uncovering the secrets of the spy base. This is 2022. This is June 22, July 22, August, I think the 8th of August. This is October. This is now. So He's documented the replacement and upgrading of a crucial antenna used to listen in on Russian and Chinese satellites. You can see the old antenna being uncovered and removed here, the new antenna putting place here, the covering replaced. So over that three and a half, four months period, virtually in real time, we can see that a very important part of Pine Gap's functioning, particularly apropos China, is expanding. China has certainly now in, in the last five years, particularly in the last three years, undoubtedly become the main focus of the monthly and weekly tasking schedules for the Pine Gap, for the satellites attached to Pine Gap. Uh, China, I think, will not only now is the, the main focus, I'm quite sure that the electronic order of battle, um, the searching for Chinese missile sites, the first searching for Chinese command sites, in a preparatory way, is absolutely on uh, high priority at Pine Gap now. But after 2015... And he's uncovered evidence that Pine Gap is growing. This is a graph of antennas at Pine Gap over a 50-year period. This is a, a crude measure of the growth in size and in capability of Pine Gap. 
When we did our major study of antennas in 2015, we counted 33 antennas there. In the most recent survey we're about to publish, we have counted 45. So that's a big jump uh, in seven years. And though not only is there an increase in the number of antennas, but the type of antennas have, have changed, the capabilities of those antennas and the systems associated with them. This indicates the extraordinary importance and the increasing importance to the United States at a time of potential war with China. But hosting probably the most important American intelligence base in the world is a signal to China that Australia is utterly committed to the American version of re relations with China, which are not good for the Chinese, especially because it carries with it a role in existential nuclear threat to China. They're not going to forget that. If Australia wants to forfeit all its economic interests with China and always embrace the United States in the hostilities against China, then I'm afraid Australia will be dealt with in the same vein as China will deal with the United States if war breaks out between these two countries. In Australia's tropical north, any threat posed by China seems a world away. Many here are embracing the benefits from Australia's closer relations with the US. In Darwin, business is booming. The military is pumping billions of dollars into the economy. It's always been a big booster of our economy. Darwin is a garrison town. Darwin has been a garrison town. So there's a lot of money rolling into the economy. Just last month, air forces from 17 countries held exercises across northern Australia, showing off their air power. They staged a flyover of Darwin in a very public show of working together. People just stormed down the middle bits to have a look at the different airplanes because there were a variety of airplanes from different nations, from Germany, from Japan, from Indonesia, from America. People loved it, simply loved it. That shows you a lot about the support that this kind of exercise they've got in Darwin and how people support the defence forces here in Darwin. Not only in Darwin, but in Catherine and everywhere else in the territory. Give us the run through what we've got here. If it's USSS, it's American. Yep. And yes, George Phillips, American, Preble, American, PLA Navy, which is the Chinese Navy, USS Denver, got the Thai, we've got Indonesian. So you've got every different country that comes to Darwin, comes in and say, hello, here's a hat. But that shows you exactly where Darwin sits and what it means for the defence of Australia. How do you feel about the broader defence build-up going on across the Northern Territory? What I see here, it makes me feel more comfortable. Uh, I don't feel abandoned. I don't feel being left out without any support. Uh, I know if something goes wrong, at least somebody will be here to defend our country. Every year before they head home, the US Marines take on local rugby team, the Darwin Stray Cats. It's a little bit about rugby, and it's a lot about all of you, and how much we appreciate this partnership and you welcoming us to Darwin every single year. So thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, so we're covering the ball. All right, we're ready to go. The Marines are still learning the rules of the game. Okay, so Will's going to come in here and try to blow this up. Get low and use the body of the ball carrier. Come back over, and you're not going to move from that position, all right? What are we yelling? Marine Corps on three. One, two, three. Marine Corps! What we do is inherently challenging, but it's a lot easier when you have Australian military personnel by your side helping you solve the problem. And I've never received a, a warmer welcome than I have here in the Northern Territory. So we really do feel like we're part of the family here. The ground truth is I don't actually understand rugby, but I think that was good. We will see much greater numbers of US military personnel forward located in Australia. That will include personnel from all three services, Navy, Air Force and Army, as well as the Marines in Darwin, which are likely to be expanded. So this is just really the start? This is the start. Australia is now a much larger target. This has prompted an urgent review of our defence capabilities. And I hope, by the way, in this new defence strategic review, we will be more serious about projecting serious long-range missile strike capability. We need many more long-range, conventional strike weapons. Anti-ship missiles, air-to-air -air missiles, and air-to-ground missiles. We can develop that capability, which exists already, and we have some of them, but in very small amounts. But I'm saying now, time is of the urgency. This is not a, a theoretical potential threat. As the drums of war beat louder, Australia is in lockstep with the United States in a dangerous and unstable region. I don't think that war is inevitable, but the United States and its allies and partners have to take the threat seriously enough to make significant changes to deter China. What we currently have in place, militarily and economically, is not enough to convince Xi Jinping that it's not worth it. Do I think the current environment is the most dangerous I've seen in my lifetime? That is a big question. I've had a long lifetime. The Cold War was very dangerous, and it wasn't just the Cuban Missile Crisis. The 1983 crisis in Europe was much more dangerous. But that was the other side of the world. In terms of this part of the world, this is the most dangerous situation I've experienced. If Australia wants to go into a war which may lead to Armageddon, you think about the consequence. I really do not want to express that consequence in front of your audience. 